Welcome, and thank you for viewing our weekly sermon. I'm Pastor Malone, and I pray this message be a blessing to you and help you grow closer to Jesus. If you'd like to know more about having a personal relationship with Jesus or to connect with us as a church, please visit westacres.org. Thanks again, and God bless. A single point of light in the darkness, small, innocuous, yet this single point of light can spread its warmth and multiply exponentially until there are more points of light than stars in the sky. I hope you're here to, to praise him and we're going to come to the King of Kings, uh, his word at this time. Uh, so turn with me to the book of Acts. We're going to be starting a new chapter, Acts chapter 11. I'll we'll be going through the book of Acts uh, since uh, the beginning of the year, going through this book verse by verse. And uh, I know we took a week off last week, but previously uh, we have been studying the story of Peter and Cornelius. And if you're visiting with us, that story is a very big deal uh, because that is the story of salvation, the gospel message of Jesus Christ going to the Gentiles. Now, who are the Gentiles? That's anyone that's not Jewish. That's pretty much the majority of this room today. That, that is the nations, everyone outside of Israel. So praise be to God that salvation went to the Gentiles because we are the benefactors of that. Uh, but we've come back to Acts chapter 11. Uh, Peter has made his way back to Jerusalem, and we'll see how he is welcomed with this awesome, awesome news. Uh, Acts chapter 11, please stand with me as we honor and read God's word. Verses 1 through 18 today. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. So Peter went up to Jerusalem. The circumcision party criticized him, saying... You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them? But Peter began and explained it to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa, praying. And in a trance, I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners. And it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were sent to me from Caesarea. And the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. As I began to speak... The Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. It's a reference to the day of Pentecost. And I remember the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent. And they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Let us pray. Father, as we come to your word this morning, I pray that you will please just uh, remove all distractions from this place. Father, I pray that we will be here Lord, just as Cornelius was ready to hear Peter preach your word, Lord, I pray our church will be ready for your word today ready to hear this word, especially a word that teaches us not to get in your way. So, Father, I pray that we'll be teachable, 
I pray that we'll be humble. I pray that we'll be flexible today. Have your way today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The title of today's message is Don't Stand in God's Way. Don't Stand in God's Way. And with a title like that, I know some of you are probably thinking, man, I'm going to take it easy. I've never crossed that line before. I've never stood in God's way, and I never will stand in God's way. However, if you take an honest evaluation of your life, you will realize you have stood in God's way a lot. In fact, everybody in this room has stood in God's way at some point or another because everybody in this room has dealt with this three-letter word called sin. Guess what? If you're a sinner, you have stood in God's way way. Throughout the Bible and in our day-to-day -day lives, we recognize that sin always gets in God's way. Uh, there's a verse in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6. It captures this truth uh, very well. It says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. When you choose your way, you're standing in God's way. When we choose our way, we're saying, God, I don't want your way. We see an example of this when Peter returned to Jerusalem after his historic, historic visit at Cornelius' house. After Peter delivered the gospel to the Gentiles, he was quickly welcomed by a church that was dangerously standing in God's way. Why do I say that? Uh, because the church, uh, they, had a, they took issue with Peter associating with Gentiles. In their minds, they were saying this, salvation's not for them, salvation's for us. How dare you associate with a different people group? Peter, they were standing in God's way. We already know how this story goes, if you've been a part of this study for some time. So as we look at our study today, if you're taking notes, our text today can be divided into three sections. Number one, the confrontation. Number two, the correction. And number three, the celebration. I wish that was, I wish we were beginning with celebration, but we're going to begin with the confrontation. Look at, let's look at verses one through three. Now, the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party, that being the Jews, criticized him, saying, you went to the uncircumcised men, that being Gentiles, and ate with them. When Cornelius' household got saved, this was a historic day in the life of the church. Salvation had finally come to the Gentiles. And this shouldn't have been a surprise for the church, because if they had been reading their Bible, if they'd been reading the Bible they had, the Word, the Old Testament, they would have realized that this was always going to be a part of God's plan. God's plan was always to bless the world. He even told Abraham, you will be a blessing to the nations. You will be a blessing to the world. Uh, we see in Isaiah 49, verse 6, speaking of the Messiah, he would be a light to the nations. And his salvation reaching to the ends of the earth. What does that mean for, for this Jewish audience? That means, wow, people outside of Israel, people that aren't Jewish, are going to be saved. They are going to be worshipers of the one true God. They, too, are going to praise the King of kings. It's not just for us. It's for everybody. History was in the making. But if you were following closely when I read this story. How was this historic event welcomed? How was it received? How did the church react to this incredible and joyous news that salvation had come to the Gentiles? Did they rejoice at first? No. They complained. They, they confronted Peter and criticized him for associating with people that were different. Notice if you go back to those verses, there is no excitement over salvation at all. Peter has just come back from Jerusalem. The word has spread. Nobody is excited. There's no Jim Garners there raising his hands. There's no amens. There's no hallelujahs. There's none of that. There's criticism. There's complaining. 
I can just picture Peter making his way back to Jerusalem. He's just had one of those mountaintop experiences in life and ministry. He has just been the bearer of good news to the Gentiles. He has delivered the gospel. He was commanded to deliver the gospel, and he delivered it successfully. The Holy Spirit comes upon Cornelius' house just like the day of Pentecost. This, this was a spirit filled time. I mean, the, the, the hairs on his arms are standing up. Peter is probably filled with the Spirit, happy, joyful, can't wait to get back and share this good news with the church. But what is he welcomed by? He is welcomed by criticism. Peter's experience reminds me of the church today. Yeah, you can have times of revival, you can have times of joy, you can have times where God is really doing something big, and people will meet it with criticism. Even in the church today, you can have a full house on Sunday, people getting saved, baptisms, generous giving, heartfelt, spirit-filled worship, powerful preaching. I mean, the church can have it going on. And at the end of the day... People go to lunch, people go home, and they got something to complain about. They got something to criticize. Dear church member, are you a worshiper or are you a complainer? Are you a worshiper or are you a complainer? When the church starts to grow and, and things are, are really booming and things are changing in a good way, do you get mad or do you get glad? I don't know if that commercial has copyright on that statement. But do you get mad when those things happen or, or do you get glad? When you come to church on Sunday, I would say this in any church, by the way, and somebody is sitting in your seat, do you get mad or do you get glad? I, wonder, I want you to be honest with yourself. Praise God if somebody new joins us on a Sunday. Amen. Praise God if you come in here. I don't care if you put your Bible down or not. And somebody's moved it. Praise God somebody's sitting in the place you usually sit. Okay? And I got to say this. We don't have assigned seats here. I know we're creatures of habit, but we don't have assigned seats here. These pews aren't yours. These pews belong to the Lord, and may they be filled with worshipers, not complainers. Peter was met with criticism. The Jewish Christians took issue that he had associated with Gentiles. I must point out that the church at this point, they're in the dark. They're ignorant. Even though they had the word of God, they, didn't, they haven't had anybody to point it out to them. It's still in their minds, there's to, to be a dividing line between Jew and Gentile. They haven't gotten the memo yet. And we knew this already. God had to do a work in Peter's life before he could bring the news to the church. Because he had the same prejudices just weeks or days earlier. Even though God had slowly been softening in his heart in this area. The Jewish Christians, even though you're ignorant, listen to this, they were in the wrong. Ignorance is never an excuse. They were wrong, but thankfully Peter was there to correct them. That's our second point I want to share with us, the correction. This is pretty much the body of our text today, but I'm going to go through this quickly. Look at verse 4. But Peter began and explained it to them in order. Peter doesn't have to stretch the details. He doesn't have to make the story more palatable. He wasn't just walking back to Jerusalem saying, man, how am I going to break this news? I don't even know if he was anticipating this, this storm of criticism or not. But he didn't have to stretch the details. He didn't have to make the story more palatable. He didn't have to get back and, and speak to John and James and, and all those guys and say, guys, how are we going to break this news to the church? He didn't have to get a lawyer. You know what Peter did? When he was faced with his confrontation, when he was faced with this criticism, when he was faced with this, this grave problem, these guys are mad at him. You know what he did? He told the truth. Amen. He told the truth. I don't know if you're facing some problems today, but I, we've heard this growing up. I've heard my mom, my dad, your Sunday school teachers. 
truth is always the best medicine. Just tell the truth. Peter told the story like it was. He had nothing to hide. He retells the entire story so they can understand that God is doing something new. That God was opening the door of salvation. Not just opening. He has already opened the door of salvation for Gentiles. Interestingly, this is the third time this story is in the book of Acts. Interestingly, this is the third time just in two chapters that we have this this recount of of Peter's vision and Cornelius' story repeated to us three times. This takes valuable real estate in the Bible. And while Luke was the, the earthly, the human writer of the book of Acts, we also know that the Holy Spirit is the true author of the book of Acts. He's the one that inspired this text. Why on earth would God want us to know this story three times? Why on earth would God want some church that likes going through verse by verse to preach on this subject three times? I want you to think of this too. Luke wasn't typing on a computer. He didn't have a tablet. He didn't have just an endless space. He was writing on paper. He was writing on scroll, using ink. These things were costly during this time in history. Why on earth would God want him to write this down three times? Because we're hard-headed. We're stubborn. We're forgetful. God wanted us to have this threefold repetition so we would know his feelings about prejudice. His feelings about racism. He wanted the people to know that, listen, I am ending this dividing line. Salvation is for the Jews, the Samaritans, and the Gentiles. Jesus came to the world. Think of this. What is the world full of? Sinners. We have all sinned. Jesus died for all. That is the message that's being conveyed. As we look at Peter's retelling of this story, I want to point out five key witnesses of his defense that are going to lead the church to see things differently. Peter's telling the truth, but just listen to how loaded this story is with defense. He doesn't have to debate, he just tells the truth. The first witness is this, the witness of prayer. Verse 5, we learn that this whole story started while Peter was in Joppa praying. This whole ordeal began with prayer. I want you to know this. Peter was not an advocate for Gentile salvation. He he did not have a bumper sticker on the back of whatever back then saying, wow, I hope the Gentiles really get saved. Peter was as Jewish as it gets. He had the same prejudices as the people that were confronting him had. He did not have an agenda. He, he He wasn't wearing a button saying, wow, I hope the Gentiles get saved. He wasn't that guy. Peter didn't have an agenda for any of this. God's agenda came to Peter while he was in prayer. Make note of this. Great things happen in prayer. Great movements of God happen in prayer. God's will is to be sought in prayer. Number two, the witness of the vision. Verses 5 through 10, Peter retells about this, this vision that he received of the, the great sheet descending from heaven that had all these different types of animals on it, both clean and unclean. And what we know already is that God was revealing to Peter two things. One, that all these dietary restrictions that the Jews had been following all these years since the, the law of Moses was given, they were being abolished. They were being abolished, not just so Peter could enjoy catfish and pigs and all those things, but it was so Peter and the Christians could enjoy fellowship with Gentiles because table fellowship is a requirement for the church. We're supposed to be together. We're supposed to fellowship. We are supposed to be together. But if God didn't take away these dietary restrictions, you would not have been able to have one church. You would have had the Jewish church. You would have had the Gentile church. There still would have been a segregation. There still would have been a separation. Folks, that isn't going to happen in God's way of doing things. There's only one church. But these animals on this sheet, they weren't just reflecting dietary restrictions uh, that were being abolished. They, They were reflecting that God was bringing salvation to the Gentiles. 
No people group would be called common or unclean. Verse 10 says this, that this vision was repeated three times. Three times. Peter was not experiencing something like we do. Man, I had a crazy dream last night. I can't really remember. I should have wrote it down. No, this was no weird or obscure vision. This was a clear vision. And Peter even says this, I looked at it closely. Not only did this once, but he had his interchange with God, saying, God, no, I'm not going to eat this stuff. I've never done this before. God says, whatever I call clean, don't call common. That doesn't just happen once. It happens three times times Peter receives a clear word a clear vision from the Lord number three we have the witness of the spirit after this vision the Holy Spirit speaks to Peter and tells him to accompany the three men that were sent by Cornelius in this passage we're also given a new detail in verse 12 the spirit revealed to Peter that he is to make no distinction Peter did not come to that understanding on his own. Peter was not left on his own making this trip to to Cornelius' house going, man, what does this vision mean? No, God was clear. The Spirit of God was clear. You were to make no distinction, Peter. No distinction between Jew and Gentile. Peter's already done this already. He's allowed these three men to come spend the night before they make the trip to Cornelius' house. But it's one thing to have Gentiles in your house, but it's a whole other thing to be a Jew and to spend time in a Gentile's house. And you know they had a good time. You know that Peter was probably coming back. He had probably had a ham sandwich the first time in his life at Cornelius' house. He was experiencing all these things. But Peter, uh, the witness of the Spirit goes further, not just the voice of the Spirit, not just the voice of truth coming to the Peter, but they see the, the Spirit visibly and audibly falling on Cornelius's house, the witness of the Spirit. We have the witness of prayer. We have the witness of the Spirit. Then we also have the witness of Peter's Jewish companions. Remember them? Verse 12 tells us that Peter's experience at Cornelius's house was witnessed by other Jewish Christians. God did not command this, but Peter uh, through his own doing, God was working sovereign, sovereignly through this decision. Didn't just go to Cornelius' house by himself, but he took six other Jewish Christians with him. Jewish brothers. And he even says, these six brothers, they were there with me. They saw everything happen. So what happens when you have six Jewish brothers and the so-called leader of the apostles? You have seven witnesses. What does the Old Testament call for when it comes to witnesses? Two or three witnesses. God says, I'm going to do you even better. I'm going to double that number plus one. I'm going to give you seven witnesses for this momentous occasion. Number five, finally, you had the witness of the word. I think we could have ended with number four. That that should have been suffice, but we never have anything without God's word. The witness of the word after Peter and his companions witnessed the Holy Spirit coming upon Cornelius' household, Peter remembered the word of Jesus. He says, I remember the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. There's no better witness than the word of God. There's no better witness. Jesus promised his disciples that they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. He's not talking about, he didn't say, I'm just promising Jews will be given the Holy Spirit. But my followers, my disciples, those who believe will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had just come upon Gentiles uh, during this momentous occasion at Cornelius' house. And these were not Jewish Followers. They, they, were, they were uncircumcised men. They, they, they didn't follow the laws of Judaism. Cornelius and the men of his household were not circumcised to be saved. They simply had to believe. And we know this already, that Peter didn't even have to give an altar call. As soon as he started preaching, as soon as they heard that all he got to do was believe, they believed. And the Holy Spirit fell upon that house. With all this being said, Peter was essentially saying this, and this is going to come back later in the book of Acts, 
that when these Gentiles start getting saved, I mean, it's going to get crazy when Paul goes on the mission field. When, when, when these Gentiles start getting saved, there's still going to be this, this group within Judaism saying, no, they've got to become Jews first. They've got to become Jews first. Uh, Judaism is the vestibule to Christianity. You've you got to go through the door of Judaism first to be saved, which means you'd have to, to follow this, this, and this. You'd have to be circumcised to be saved. Peter is essentially saying, no, sir. No, sir. God, you know how he knows? Because these folks just got saved without doing any of that. These folks just got saved without doing anything related to Judaism. They simply had faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. And if you're coming to church today in 2023 and you're like, goodness gracious, this guy's talking about circumcision, uncircumcision, what on earth is going on? Let me just get to the point. You don't have to work for your salvation. You simply come to Jesus with a repentant heart and you ask him to be your Lord and Savior. You don't have to climb a hill. You just come to your Savior. Verse 17 is Peter's closing statement. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? That's where we get the title for our message today, Don't Stand in God's Way. Peter could not and he would not stand in God's way. After he was given this truth, after we are given the truth of God, you should have no choice but to obey. Peter had no choice but to obey. God's perfect will was being done. Salvation was being made available to all people groups of the world. Jews, Samaritans, and Gentiles. As Peter tells this truth, we see that the church has a change of heart. Their criticism turns into celebration. That's our final point today. Verse 18. When they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Initially, after they hear Peter uh, give this, this defense, after Peter just simply tells the truth, what do they do? They're silent. They're silent. They can't refute anything Peter has just said because they know this is the truth. They know that this is indeed God's doing. They were silenced. A lot like the Pharisees in the Gospels. If you read about the Pharisees, so many times they tried to put Jesus in a corner. You don't put Jesus in a corner, okay? Anytime they tried to trick Jesus and they tried to refute anything he said, Jesus would speak truth. And it says this, the Pharisees would be silenced. The Pharisees would be silenced. So the church was silenced when they were faced with this truth. But I'm so glad it doesn't just end with silence. I'm so glad that the church, what is the church made up of, by the way? Is this just a group of people that are just at a place called a church that day? No. The church is a body of believers, a body of Christ. Folks that are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. I'm so glad the church that day, we know this. They're not Pharisees. They don't have stone hearts. They don't have hardened hearts. They got softened hearts. They got hearts that are tender. They got hearts that embrace truth when they are faced with it. So they, they're not only silenced, but their silence turns into celebration. Celebration. After receiving this good news, they glorified God because he had provided salvation for the Gentiles. This is, this is how the story should have started. When, when, when Peter got to Jerusalem, there, there should have been a parade. There should have been just jubilant celebration going on. But it didn't happen at first because they didn't know the facts. They didn't know the truth. But I'm so thankful the story gets to where it needs to be, that the people start celebrating over Salvation Church. That's something you better be celebrating today when people get saved in this church, when people get baptized, when God is doing great things. You should celebrate What took place at Peter, the story of Peter and Cornelius is a big deal because God was providing salvation for all people. I want to be clear, God's not saving all people, that's universalism, but he was providing 
salvation for all people. Here's the bad news if you read your Bible. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, which is separation from God, which is damnation, which is hell. Man, we have a God that is good. We have a God that is just. We have a God that is fair. Because the Bible doesn't say all have sinned, but Jesus has just come to save this little group. Now, my Bible tells me this. God sent his son to the world because God so loved the world. Jesus died for all. That salvation is available for all. That's a big deal. So the church's criticism was corrected. Thankfully, that correction turned their criticism into celebration. Praise the Lord when he hits us with truth. Praise God when you get hit in the face with truth. Praise God when your toes get stepped on with truth. It doesn't feel good, does it? Some of y'all are like, oh God, Pastor, why'd you do that today? That wasn't me, that was the Holy Spirit. But praise God when we get hit with truth. And I, want, I just want to say this to the church. When we get hit with truth, we should receive it just like this church did today. Their criticism turned in to correction which turned into celebration. God pointed out something that was wrong in their lives, and they didn't sit there with their arms folded, grinding their teeth, but they were sitting there saying, thank God I know of this truth, I know of this change, and I will receive it. Praise God for speaking to me with His truth. Peter wouldn't stand in God's way, neither would the early church stand in God's way. And folks, I pray that West Acres Baptist Church never stand in God's way. When we are hit with truth, when we are hit with, with correction from God, may we be like the wise man in Proverbs. May we take it gracefully. May we be humble. May we be teachable. May we be flexible servants of the Lord. I close going back to Jesus' Lord's Prayer when he was teaching his disciples how to pray. You might be familiar with this line, but when he was teaching his disciples to pray, this is one of the first lines in that prayer. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. He not only taught his disciples to pray like that, but folks, even when he was faced with the cross, when he was faced just hours before his death, when he says, is there any way for this cup to be removed from me? Jesus prayed this, not my will, but your will. May that be our prayer. May we never stand in God's way, but may we always be servants that want to be in line with his way. Let us pray.